Hello. John chapter 21. One final time. This is the last chapter of John. Chapter 21. This is New Testament video 323, John Lesson 77. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Heavenly Father, may this edify, encourage, and enlighten us. As always, may we rightly divide the word of truth as the Holy Spirit teaches us through his words. Preserved here in the book of John. Thank you for this opportunity to teach and learn in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are almost finished with the book of John. I will read the entire chapter so the context can be established. John chapter 21. Deep breath. John 21 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. Nine. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up, and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And were for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh, and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples, after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time. 16. 
Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? 24. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So, our goal, our objective, is to teach the remainder of John 21. A brief review. The disciples, Simon Peter is the leader. They're up north on the Sea of Galilee. In John, the Gentile name is the Sea of Tiberias. Here's the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, right there. John 21, 2. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two other with them, two other disciples, unknown. They aren't named. Does it matter who they are? Verse 3, Simon Peter announces, I go a-fishing. Peter, of course, and James and John, sons of Zebedee, they're fishermen. We read that last time. Matthew 4, Mark 1, Luke 5. We'll read them again later. John 21, 3. We also go with thee. So seven disciples in all, Peter leading. 
these other six to go fishing. Verse 3, they entered the ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Zero. No fish. In the morning, Jesus stands on the shore. The disciples don't know who he is. Children, five, have you any meat? They answered him, no. Cast the net on the right side. The right side of the ship and ye shall find. They threw their net over. And now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple seven, whom Jesus loved, John, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Simon Peter realizes who it is. It's the Lord. I'd better put on more clothes. He had his undergarments on. Puts a coat on now. Peter throws himself into the sea. He's swimming, he's walking, he's wading, heading to shore. He can't wait to meet the Lord. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were, 200 cubits. About 100 yards. 91 meters. Short distance. Dragging the net with fishes. As soon then, as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish, which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up, and drew the net to land, full of great fishes. An hundred and fifty and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. This is an historical event. It happened literally, physically, visibly. Yet this is a picture, a preview, a prophecy of what will happen in the ages to come? This is Christ's second coming. And subsequent millennial reign. Thousand year kingdom. This eighth sign of John. This miraculous demonstration. A sign of the gospel of the kingdom. The Jews require a sign. John has selected eight signs. Chapter 20, 30 and 31. To bring Israel, Israel, Israel to the place of seeing Jesus as Christ, Son of God, King he is the king of the gospel of the kingdom. He's the king of the kingdom of the gospel of the kingdom. The Lord Jesus Christ will be for Israel what they need him to be. He will do for Israel what they need him to do. Grace, grace. The kingdom blessings... What is necessary? What must happen if the nation Israel is to ever be God's kingdom of priests in the earth? And that's future. We study the book of John and see. We can look at all four gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
But John has a special emphasis. Eight unique signs found nowhere else in the Bible except one. And that's the feeding of the 5,000. The other miracles, the other signs in John are found only in John. Not Matthew, not Mark, not Luke. There's a second coming preview and a kingdom preview in John 21. The right side. Catch the fish on the right side, little flock. The right side is the sheep nations of the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 25. When the king shall come and sit on the throne of his glory, he will separate the nations. Those who blessed Israel, there's the righteous, there are the sheep. He puts them on the right side, his right hand. Those who cursed Israel, unbelievers, those are the goats, they go on the left. The goats, the nations cursed of God, go to everlasting hellfire. The nations who blessed Israel, and this is all during Daniel's 70th week. This is not our dispensation of grace at all. This is not the body of Christ at all. The nations who blessed Israel during Daniel's 70th week, they are permitted entrance into the kingdom. That's what this eighth sign is about. The little flock meeting the Lord Jesus at his second coming, fellowshipping with him, bringing believing Gentiles to him. Remember, it is not a secret in prophecy that Gentiles will be saved. Gentiles, the nations, will be saved, blessed of God, through Israel's rise to kingdom glory. Isaiah 60, we read that in our previous study. Zechariah 8, the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12. The mystery, the secret committed to the Apostle Paul's trust is through Israel's fall, fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Do you see the difference? Romans 11. Prophecy, Gentiles are saved through Israel's rise to kingdom glory. Mystery, Gentiles are saved through Israel's fall. See? One is up, the other is down. They're different. Israel rising, Israel falling. Those are two different concepts. If we are honest with the scriptures. John 21, 12. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine, and none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh, and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. This is the third time he appears post-resurrection to a group. A group. Chapter 20, verse 19, first appearance to a group. Chapter 20, 26, John 20, 26, there's his second appearance to a group. Now, the third appearance, John 21. John 21 is an epilogue, an addendum. After you've understood the first 20 chapters, 
the Holy Spirit puts something else, another chapter here. Capstone. What has gone before in the book of John forms a foundation for what we have now in the last chapter. So this eighth miracle, eight in the Bible, is new beginnings. Seven is completion, perfection. Well, what comes after seven? Mm, eight. Eight. We start again, new beginnings. So this sign of the draw of fishes, the 153 fishes, this sign depends on the first seven brought to fruition. In our next study, when we review the book of John, I will give you the final pieces to the puzzle. All this time, almost 80 lessons, we've been building toward that review study, which follows this one right now. In our next video, we review John and provide the full picture, the purpose of John. Having gone through it verse by verse, we better appreciate, understand it for what it is instead of thinking ab about what it isn't. Christendom has, has missed, missed, the purpose of the book of John is a failure to rightly divide the word of truth. No surprise. Dispensational Bible study is the key to understanding and enjoying the Bible. John 21 Verse 15. Here is our current study. John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus invited them to eat. He had a fire of coals, verse 9, fish laid thereon, and bread. He cooked. The Lord is a culinary expert. He's the creator. Definitely. He has just served them the most delicious food they've ever eaten or will ever eat. Come dine. It's a picture of Israel's believing remnant, the little flock, fellowshipping, communing with their Lord in the kingdom. Emmanuel, God with us. They're eating the fish Jesus cooked. They aren't eating the fish they caught. The fish that they caught, remember, represent the believing Gentile nations. They bring the Gentile nations to the one true God. John 21, 15. So when they had dined, they ate the meal, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. 16. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. 
he saith unto him, Feed my sheep. 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now what is going on here? The Lord posed the same question to Simon Peter thrice, three times, three times. Lord, are you deaf? Peter answered you, and you asked again. And Peter answered you, and you asked again. And Peter answered you. Three questions, the same question. And three answers, the same answer. Why three times? John 21, 15, they've dined, and the Lord addresses Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Remember, this fishing miracle. That's just gone before the conversation. If we understand the context, there will be no struggling to comprehend the rest of the chapter. So let's listen, let's pay attention. Again. We will recall Matthew. Matthew 4. Might as well read it now. Matthew 4, verse 18. This was three years before John 21. At the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry, Matthew 4, 18, And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, same place where they are in John 21, the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Matthew 4. Mark 1. 
Mark's account. Mark 1, 16. Now, as Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers, fishermen. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Mark 1, 19. And when he had gone a little farther thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets, and straightway, immediately, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants, and went after him. It's Mark. Luke 5. Luke chapter 5. Verse 1. Luke gives us more information, more details. Luke 5, 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. That's the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Tiberias. And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering, verse 5, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus saith unto Simon, Fear not. From henceforth thou, Simon, one man, thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Jump ahead three years. Jesus' earthly ministry is over. He's been formally rejected, crucified, murdered, he has died, he has been buried, and he has been raised again. He visited the little flock in John 20. In John 21, do you notice what did those disciples do? Peter is there, the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, there. Back in Matthew 4, Mark 1, Luke 5, Peter, James and John left their fishing nets, fishing boats, fishing business behind. Come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Preachers. The gospel of the kingdom that I will commission you to preach will be the means whereby you recruit souls. Bring them to me. Fish for men's souls. People's souls. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They left their fishing endeavors behind and followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at this, John 21. What have they done? They've gone back to the old life, huh? I thought they gave up fishing and they got into the 
Lawrence Ministry. Oh, they're back to fishing. Hmm. And what does it profit them? They fished during that night and they caught nothing. Nothing. Just like Luke 5, three years prior. See the connection. But, as in Luke 5, when the Lord gives the command, the power in the Word of God, the powerful Word of God goes forth, it brings results, doesn't it? In Luke 5, the multitude of fishes got in the net. They got in the net. The net broke. John 21, they fished all night, caught nothing. Throw your net on the right side, the Lord's word to them. They throw the net, oh look, and the net doesn't break. Multitude of fishes. Fishing in the flesh. Fishing by means of the flesh. Human effort. Nothing. It'll amount to nothing. But when the power of God is there, look what happens. Luke 5, John 21. John was able to make the connection here. It's the Lord. It has to be. I remember Luke 5. John 21. Peter is the leader of Israel's 12 apostles. Matthew 16, 19. Matthew 16, 19. He's always listed first with the apostles. Matthew 10, Mark 3, Luke 6, Acts 1. Since Peter is the leader of the little flock, the chief apostle of Israel, the head of the Messianic Church under the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, but the apostle Peter is the focus of that threefold inquiry in John 21. 15, 16, and 17. Again, this is not the church, the body of Christ. This is not the dispensation of grace. This is not the Apostle Paul's ministry. It has nothing to do with us. But it's Israel and prophecy. It's not mystery. It's not body of Christ. Okay. John 21. 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Simon, son of Jonas. Let us well turn. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Look at the Messianic church. Matthew 16, 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Matthew 16, 17, Blessed art thou, Simon, bore Jonah. Simon, son of Jonah. Simon, son of Jonas. Jonah. Jonah. Like the prophet Jonah. Jonas. Matthew 12, Jonah is called Jonas. Simon bore Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. 
18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's the Messianic church, Israel's believing remnant. Okay, 19. It's not us. Matthew 16, 19. And I will give unto thee, one man, see, thee, in modern English, it would be, I give unto you, but in that's ambiguous, how is it you, Peter, or you, the group? Don't know. Older English reflects the specificity of the Greek language. Older English is superior to modern English. That is why we use the King James Bible. One of the reasons. Matthew 16, 19, And I will give unto thee, one man, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou, one man, shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's Peter. Now look at the group. Might as well throw this in. Matthew 18, 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Verse 19, again I say unto you, see, a group, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That's apostolic authority in Israel. This is prophecy. It's not a prayer promise for us in mystery. Whatever two or three agree on in prayer, God will give it. That's not what this is about. Apostolic authority. The leaders of the Messianic Church. They're functioning in Jesus' absence to take official action while he's away. They're given permission. And the Holy Spirit works in them to fulfill this in the book of Acts, early Acts. And on. All right. So John 21, John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas. The modern English versions introduce another name here, son of John. It's Jonas, okay? Son of Jonas. Bore Jonah, not bore John. Bore Jonah. Son of Jonas. Son of Jonah. Simon, son of Jonas. John 21, 15. Lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Now, 15, 16, and 17. They don't read verbatim, but they're close. Okay. We want to tackle all three. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Now, who are the these? What are the these? This topic has been vigorously debated. It is such a shame. It is. It is. Natural man thinking dominates and confuses the matter. Let me give you the possibilities. And let's use our renewed mind to figure out which one is correct. What is the correct view? Okay. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? What or who are the these? What are the these in verse 15?
Is it, do you love me more than you love these men, these disciples? Or is it, do you love me more than these disciples love me? Or is there a third view? Peter, do you love me more than you love these men? Peter, do you love me more than these men love me? As Bible believers, we can reject both of those interpretations, those senses. In Matthew 20, here is our reasoning. We look at verses, compare verses, study verses, not speculations and hunches and inner impressions. I feel this is right. We need verses to support our views. Let's try Matthew 20. Matthew 20, 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children, that would be James and John's mother, with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. Verse 24. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. You read up to verse 28. There's a spirit of competition, rivalry here. Jealousy, envy. James and John and their mother asked the Lord for the two highest positions in his government. James and John want that place, those places for themselves. The other ten apostles grew upset, naturally. So, you mean those two, James and John, are better than us? The Lord, He corrects them. Read Matthew 20, 20 through 28. You want to be chief? Be the servant. Hmm? Humility. The man who will be great among you, let him be your minister. After all, I'm better than all of you combined. And what have I come to do? I've come to serve, to minister, and to give my life a ransom for many. If I am the supreme being in that kingdom, why not focus on me and stop thinking of self, 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 self? I, I, I. I am the king, and yet I'm the servant. I'm chiefest among you. And look how I'm humble. Mark 10, it's recorded there. Again, Mark 10, 35 to 45, you can read that. The night of his arrest, Luke 22, Luke 22, he informs them, someone will betray me, that traitor is sitting at the table with us. Luke 22, 23. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. 
24. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he has to teach them again, correct them again. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Ministry is not a competition. I won't betray him. I would never do that. Must be you. No, it's not me. I'm always faithful. I'm always loyal. I'm the greatest. I'll never betray him. It's not me. The, and they bickered like children. Ministry is not not, 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 not a competition. That's the flesh. That's sin. That's not the Spirit of God. The Lord, you read Luke 22, the Lord told him, that spirit doesn't belong in my kingdom. Foolishness. That's foolishness. The Gentiles, the devil worshippers, behave like that, think like that. You're, you're, you're my father's people. Why are you thinking like the devil's people? Alright. So John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? More than what? Or who? Knowing what we've just studied, we've just read, In Matthew 20, Mark 10, and Luke 22. Jesus instructing them, correcting them. Stop thinking about self. Competing with each other. It would be unimaginable for the Lord to then pose a question. Peter, do you love me more than these disciples here love me? That would move those disciples to get upset with Peter. Huh. Okay, let's see. Out of all of you who loves me the most. See, the Lord would be reversing what he taught them earlier. So we should not interpret his question as, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these disciples love me? And it's not Simon... Do you love these disciples or do you love me? It's not, it's not that either. It's not, do you love me more than the disciples love me? No, it's not that. And it's not, do you love me more than you love the disciples? That's not it either. The best way to look at this is to think about what has gone before in John 21. Doesn't Peter love fishing? He had been a fisherman. Jesus called him away. He forsook his fishing business. But then, back again to fishing. John 21. I go a fishing. Verse 3. The Apostle Peter has abandoned ministry, and returned to fishing. So the Lord has come here to 
correct them, restore them to ministry. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Fish, fish, these fish. You've just fished all night for nothing. And then I gave you the command, and look what you caught. And now you've eaten the fish that I've cooked for you and the bread. Peter, you made a poor choice earlier, didn't you? You chose the fish over me. Let's try that again. Which do you choose, Peter? Me or the fish? Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these fish? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. 16. He saith to him again, The second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. See the variation? 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. How many times do I have to say it, Lord? <laughs> Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. You love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yes, yes. Why do I have to say it again? Yes, Lord, you know all things. Why three times? Why not two times? Or one time? Or, or five times? Or ten times? Why is it a threefold question? The same question posed three times, basically. What about John 18? John chapter 18. Now, before we get to John 18, John 13. John 13. John 13, 36. The night of Jesus' arrest. Still in the upper room there. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter saith unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me once, twice, thrice, three, three times. A thrice denial. Now we go to John 18. John 18. 16. But Peter stood at the door without. Jesus' trial underway. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. And the servants and officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them, and warmed himself. 25. 
And Simon Peter stood, John 18, and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. Two. One of the servants, 26, of the high priest being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again. Three. And immediately the cock crew. Three. Three denials. There's so much confusion. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some have come up with six or eight times, or maybe more. We find the key in John 21. See, we use other verses to unlock the verses we have trouble with. Peter, in the time since he was called into ministry, he's denied his Lord three times. He's the head of the little flock, the twelve apostles. When Jesus was arrested, it says they all forsook him. They fled. He must restore them to ministry. Particularly, Peter. Peter, this is for your own good. You have an opportunity to confess your love for me and make up for your denial of me. I want to hear three admissions to match the three denials. John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these, these fish? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. If you really love me then, Peter, you'll get on with the ministry and quit wasting time with fish. Your fishing business. There's a far more important job for you to do, Peter. If you, if, you, if you love me, you will feed my lambs. Now, keep reading. 16. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, yes, yes, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. It was feed my lambs. Now it's feed my sheep. John 21, 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. He saddened because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Omniscience. You know all things, Lord. You can read my heart. You know I love you. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. So it's, Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Peter, you don't need to be annoyed or upset or disturbed. Peter should have recalled 
my three denials must be offset. So I have to answer him three times. Yes, I love thee. Yes, I love thee. Yes, I love thee. Oh, God's grace, huh? Does Peter deserve it? No. If it depended on Peter, Peter would be out of the ministry forever. The, all the little flock, especially these seven here, these apostles who are there, don't go back to that old lifestyle. I've called you to something better. Ministry. Get on with it. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. See the agrarian terminology. Do you remember in John 10? John 10. I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Israel is likened unto a flock of sheep. Uh, the believing remnant is called the little flock. A flock of what? Sheep. See? Now that's figurative there, of course, but it's a flock. Luke 12, 32. Flock. The Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23, 1. That's Israel. That's Israel's believing remnant. Israel raises sheep. They know about the shepherd tending the sheep, guarding the sheep, feeding the sheep, on and on and on. John 10, remember, and you read John 10, the first 18 verses. I've taught that already. I don't have time to <laughs> even review it here. I'll make a quick, quick remark. Israel's religious leaders should have brought the nation to the place where they were fed with God's word. Okay. So when Messiah did arrive, they would be willing to receive him. They would recognize him because the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible doctrine in them, working in them, would have caused them to see He's fulfilling that very Bible we know. That very Bible we know. But since they weren't taught the pure word of God, rather religious tradition, the speculations of men, the rabbinical traditions and so on, they were unable to recognize the Lord Jesus Christ when he did visit them. I am the good shepherd. I have come to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They're lost. They're out of the way. They're destroyed. Not God's fault. Not my father's fault. Not mine. Whose fault? It's the, the leaders. The blind leading the blind. And just like you have millions upon millions upon millions upon millions upon millions upon millions, upon millions of church members starving, starving, learning almost nothing to nothing. Sound Bible doctrine. Very little to none. They have Bibles, they read Bibles, still confused, still in blindness, still in darkness. Not God's fault. It's the leaders who should be teaching sound Bible doctrine. Instead, they teach everything else. Whatever we see today, that was going on in Israel 2,000 years ago. That's how we know the Bible is literal. What we see today is exactly what we see in the Bible. Corrupt religious leaders. In John 10, we taught two studies on this. John 10, verses 1 through 18. Verses 1 through 18. 
want to review them. Look at New Testament videos 284 and 285. That's John lessons 38 and 39. John lesson 38, John lesson 39. New Testament videos 284 and 285. In Ezekiel 34, let me quickly show that. Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34. See, lost Israel. The shepherds, they feed themselves, but they don't feed the flocks. Okay. Well, Ezekiel 34, 11, For thus saith the Lord, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out, as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day, that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep, and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people, Ezekiel 34, 13, and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good field, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong, I will feed them with judgment. Some changes are coming in Israel. All the apostate religious leaders in the time of Ezekiel, those pre-Christ centuries, before Jesus' earthly ministry, Israel was corrupted. False doctrine. Corrupt religious leaders teaching what they want. All right. We'll fix that. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 23, 1. You know, the Holy Spirit could write the same to our church leaders today. We'll christen them. Jeremiah 23, verse 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. They scatter, they destroy the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away. The truth would have united them. But since you taught error, they're divided. My words weren't upheld. So look at my nation. Divided. Not united. Divided. Scattered. Like a flock of sheep in all different directions. Jeremiah 23, verse 2. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Judgment, and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. Here's the kingdom. Here's the millennium, as in Ezekiel. Jeremiah 23, 4, And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. Huh? John 21. And they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. See Jeremiah 23, 5, 6, 7, 8, look the kingdom. 
me. Look at our apostle here, Acts 20. Acts 20, 28. The apostle Paul advising these elders of the church at Ephesus. These church leaders from Ephesus. Acts 20, 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Oh, what happened to Israel will happen to the body of Christ. False teachers will come in, take over the ministry, and corrupt God's people. Watch out, be careful, you overseers. You're the leaders. Guard the church well. Teach sound Bible doctrine, and you will prevent false doctrine from entering your assemblies. Have our pastors, teachers, preachers, Priests done that? Mm -hmm. No. Look what happens. Acts 20, 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, perverts in the church. Not simply outside coming in, people in already. Apostates. Also of your own selves, Acts 20, 30. Shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw disciples after them? Start clicks, followings. Get some people after them. Okay. Doing what they want. Departing from the truth. Isn't that Christendom these last 2,000 years? That was Israel going back centuries before Christ too. See, Satan's policy of evil working. In religious contexts. Acts 20, 31. Therefore, watch what are most believers and church leaders and church members doing today. Ooh. Mm. Sound asleep. Not God's fault. Acts 20, 31. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. I warned you for three years. I cried as I warned you. This is serious. Take me seriously. Acts 20, 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. The message of grace. God's word rightly divided. Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The word of God's grace will deliver you from that error. Only if you want it, though. You don't want grace. You don't want the truth. The error will gobble you up it did Israel. It's done. Listen to all the denominations, cults, and sects. Look at it. All because of failure to follow Acts 20. And the advice of the Holy Spirit through our Apostle Paul. Not God's fault. I say that because usually... People blame God for the silliness in religion. God gives people over to what they want. So if we see people in religion doing whatever they want, not following the Bible, you're seeing Romans 1 in operation. God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them over. Not God's fault. That's what they wanted.
God of the Bible values free will. Don't ever forget that, my friend. If people want to die without the Lord Jesus Christ and go to an eternal lake of fire, God values free will so much, okay. You die without my son then. I gave him for you so you would trust him and not go to the, that awful place. But if that's what you want to do, you do. He doesn't force them either way. Nope. God sent me to hell. No one will ever justly, rightly say that. Oh, they can say it, but it'd be wrong. This is what I've chosen. We must take responsibility. Accountability. 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5, verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. His second coming. Feed the flock of God. See, here's the Apostle Peter. 1 Peter 5, 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, money, obtained through dishonest means. Lucrative, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. John 21, 15, feed my lambs, 16, feed my sheep, 17, feed my sheep. Lambs, see, immature, okay. new Messianic Jews, new believers, lambs, babies, spiritual babies. But see the sheep, sheep, they're mature, mature. Peter, I've given you. Doctrine. I will give you the Holy Spirit when the book of Acts opens. Acts 2 onward, Pentecost onward. You take the doctrine, my Father's doctrine, and you teach Israel, especially the little flock, what my Father has taught you through me. I've given you my Father's Word. The Holy Spirit will bring that Word to your mind, memory, and you feed the starving people of Israel. He does that in early Acts, doesn't he? Peter does it. He's in ministry again. Peter is restored to ministry. He's not the denier anymore. He's the lover. No, no, no. I don't know him. Do you love him? Yes, yes, yes. See the balance? Three times, Peter. Feed my sheep. Do what Israel's apostate leaders have failed miserably to do. And see, this looks forward to the kingdom. Jeremiah 23. And the twelve apostles being the new leaders of Israel in the ages to come. Sitting on those twelve thrones. Matthew 19, 28. Luke 22, verse 30. John 21, 15, 16, and 17. How many times must I say it? As many times, Peter, as you denied it. Denied me thrice. Now you've confessed me thrice. You're back in ministry. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Lord, thou knowest all things. John 21, 17. Lord, thou knowest all things. Yes, he knows all things. 
Jesus is God in human flesh. John 2, 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He knew they weren't really believers. They were just curiosity seekers. They sought entertainment. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. Verse 10, Jeremiah 17, 10. Even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Who knows the heart? I do. I, the Lord, know the heart. Lord, why do you ask me? You know my heart. I love you. But Peter... I want to ask you anyway because you denied it three times. This isn't for the Lord's benefit. He's asking a rhetorical question so Peter can admit it. So Peter can be restored. And it can go out to the record of Scripture. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. We have to finish John. John 21, 18. Verily, verily. Certainly, certainly, don't doubt, don't question, don't argue, believe it. I say unto thee, when thou wast young, and he's talking to Peter again, thou, see, girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. What is that about? Next verse, John 21, 19. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Now, jump forward. Peter is an old man. Thirty-something years have passed. Second Peter. Second Peter 1. 13. Peter is an old man. Simon Peter. The Apostle Peter, 2 Peter 1, verse 13. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, physical body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, physical death, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease, death, to have these things always in remembrance. Second Peter 1, verses 13, 14, and 15. Peter, there's coming a day when you will die a martyr's death. You will die for the sake of your Lord. You will serve Him in ministry and die because of it. You'll be an old man. You'll stretch forth your hands. John 21, 18. And another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. 19, the interpretation. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. You will bring God glory, Peter, by dying for him. What death is that? Stretching forth thy hands. Would that be crucifixion? The Roman mode of execution, the Roman government is ruling. Now, in the 4th century, this is hundreds of years after Peter died, after Peter 
died a martyr's death, centuries after Peter, and this would be in the fourth century, there was a church tradition that started circulating that Roman Emperor Nero, about AD 68, had crucified Peter upside down because Peter refused to be crucified right side up like his Lord. Now that's a church tradition. That's not in the Bible. Whether or not that's true, I really don't care. If it's not in the Bible, it doesn't matter. But, see that stretching forth of thy hands? Signifying by what death he should glorify God. Whoever killed Peter, whenever Peter was killed, however Peter was killed, the point is that death was the means whereby Peter glorified God. That's all we need to know. Peter, John 20, 19. Follow me. Follow me, Peter. That's what he had told them. Remember that? He told Peter. Matthew 4, Mark 1, Luke 5. Follow me. Follow me. Disciple. See? A student, a pupil, follower, disciple. A learner. We derive our English word mathematics from the Greek word for disciple. Follow me. Peter, John 21, 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Again, the disciple whom Jesus loved. The disciple whom Jesus loved. Verse 7, that disciple whom Jesus loved. Verse 24, that disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. The disciple whom Jesus loved is the writer of this gospel record. That disciple whom Jesus loved which also leaned on his breast at supper, this is John 21, 20, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? That was John 13. John 13. John 13, that disciple whom Jesus loved, he's aware of Jesus' love for him. Jesus loves other disciples, but this disciple is cognizant of God's love for him. John 13, 23, the night before Jesus died, before his arrest. John 13, 23, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. One of you will betray me. Then he then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? That disciple whom Jesus loved, John 19, verse 26. John 20, verse 2. There he is. This John, the Apostle John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was an intimate apostle, close apostle. He was one of the seven in John 21, 2. And I would take that to mean John, the son of Zebedee. John 21, 21. Peter seeing him, John. Lord, and what shall this man do? That's childish. Peter is impetuous. Instead of thinking, he usually talks and then thinks, oops, no, I shouldn't have said that. Can I take it back? No, you can't. Over and over and over. 
several times in Scripture. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Peter is stumbling over his words. Uttering foolish statements. Here's one of them. You know anything about raising children? I've raised my niece and nephew partially for almost, well, let's say more than 15 years. <laughs> okay? When I would assign one of them a task, a chore, you clean your room, wash dishes, whatever. The other one would reply, well, what is she going to do? What's he going to do? That's immaturity. Okay. Peter, think like a man, not like a child. The Lord told you, follow me. Peter turns around, looks not at the Lord, looks at John. Well, what's he going to do? Peter, you need to mind your own business. Peter, mind your own business. The Lord told you something. Don't worry about a fellow man there. Focus on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the Lord, not on a ministry co-worker. I think we learn quite a bit from that, huh? Oh, yes. See, there's a trans-dispensational issue. The work of the ministry is not a competition. Let's see if I can do more. I love the Lord more. I'm more devoted. That belongs with Satan's people, not God's people. Self, 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 see? Sinners! I, 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 I. We are saints, aren't we? First Thessalonians 4, 11. Look at this. And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business. And to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Oh, we. Second Thessalonians 3, 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Isn't that true today, huh? Busy bodies with busy lips and idle bodies. The bodies are idle, but the lips aren't. Gossips. Now them, 2 Thessalonians 3.12, Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Mind your own business, take care of your own ministry. Peter has difficulty there. The Bible tells the truth, huh? Even about its heroes, Peter's a saved man. He's the leading apostle in Israel, the prophetic program. But Peter is a man, isn't he? Not a superhero, a superhuman. See his weaknesses, his faults. Lord, and what shall this man do? Peter, you mind your own business. You focus on me and what I tell you and not worry about what John is doing and what I tell him. We had better keep our eyes, my friends, on the Lord Jesus Christ and not on our fellow man. If our eyes aren't on the Lord, we'll be disappointed. Try it and see, if you doubt me. Try it and see. John 21, 22. Jesus saith unto him, If I will, if I wish, that he tarry till I come, what is that to 
to thee. Peter will die, but what about John? Well, what about John? Jesus says, if I want that John wait till I come, what is that to thee, Peter? Don't worry about that. Peter, you follow me. Follow thou me. He, he reiterates it. Follow me, verse 19. Again, 22. Follow thou me. Don't worry about John. I'm the Lord, not you, Peter. He serves me, not you. Don't worry about others. See? Get rid of that competition. You serve me. He serves me. He is not accountable to you. You're not accountable to him. You're both accountable to me. I give the orders. You follow me. Follow me. Look at the misunderstanding. 23. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Jesus didn't say that. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? See, it was hypothetical. It, yet there was a misunderstanding. A rumor, John won't die. No, the Lord didn't insinuate that at all. It was something he said to get Peter to get Peter's eyes on the Lord and away from another believer. If I will, not he will tarry till I come, but if I will that he tarry till I come. 22. 23. 24, this is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things and we know that his testimony is true. Chapter 19, 35, and he that saw it bear record and his record is true and he knoweth that he saith true that ye might believe. This is first hand eyewitness testimony. It's not hearsay, gossip, Rumors, myths, legends. The Holy Spirit has moved that disciple whom Jesus loved, and we take that to be John. The Holy Spirit has written this book of John. We can trust it. Israel can trust it. The testimony is true. The record is true. The witness is true. The disciple who testifies of these things... John 21, 24, was the disciple who heard, saw those events of chapter 21, and chapter 20, and chapter 19, chapter 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, and so on, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hmm. This is its second-hand information. John 21, 25, almost finished with John. And there are also many other things which Jesus did. The which, if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. In John 20, verse 30, remember this? And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. Eight signs that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. See the gospel of the kingdom? And that believing ye might have life through his name. The Lord certainly did more than eight miracles during his earthly ministry. But in John's gospel record, only eight. John is not exhaustive. Read Matthew, Mark, and Luke for details not provided in John. Sermons not given in John. And look how John is so unique, so by himself most of the time. That's by divine design. Jesus did many other things. They aren't written in this book, the book of John, or anywhere in the Bible. Not what we want to know, but what we need to know. That's the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, four gospel records, 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is what the Holy Spirit thinks we need to know, not what we wish to know. Oh, I want to know more. That isn't important. Be grateful for the divine revelation we have been given. What else did Jesus say and do? Does it matter? What goes into the record of Scripture matters. God's canon, God's book is settled. It's closed. Has been for 2,000 years. Whether we accept it or not is irrelevant. God has stopped speaking. The Bible canon is closed. We don't need further gospel records, further books, further information. I want a, a word from God. Tell me, God. No, no. Give me a, a burning in the bosom. Ooh, God told me this, but not in an audible voice. The inner impressions, hunches. No, no, no. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The scriptures are enough. Scripture writing. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All good works. All that we need is in the scriptures. Rightly divided, of course. God wanted his book to be mobile, carry it around. So he limited it to what we have in these 66 books, Genesis to Revelation. Look, for example, we have to finish, close, John 7, John 7, 31. And many of the people believed on him and said, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done. I often wonder how many miracles did the Lord work during his earthly ministry. If you tally Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, no more than what? 40 specific miracles? Well, he ministered for three years. Certainly he did more than that. But they aren't recorded. They aren't recorded. Perhaps it was thousands of miracles. There was enough proof for anyone willing to see. Yep. Did they want to see? Did they want to hear? Did they want to believe? That's what made the difference. Not an evidence problem. But a heart problem. I won't believe. You can show me all that you want. God. Hmm. Amen. John 21, 25. So be it. It's true. The world couldn't even contain all the books that should be written. So many books. We wouldn't be able to carry them around. So I've limited, the Holy Spirit says, to these words. And the book of John is over. Thank you, Father God, for John verse by verse. We have one more study, the review. That's in our next lesson in Christ's name. Thank you. Amen. See you in the review and then onward to Acts.